The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. If Ontarians go to the polls asking themselves, am I better off today than four years ago? Chances are their answers will be informed by their economic circumstances. So tonight, do the parties have solutions for what economically ails voters? And is the campaign trail really the place to make such promises? We'll look into that. First up, we'll get the latest from Aaron Kelly on what the artificial intelligence known as Polly is hearing from the voters. It's Monday, May the 9th, and that's next on The Agenda. It hasn't quite been a week, but the first official push to get voters' attention has begun in earnest since the writs were drawn up last Wednesday. Has it changed the conversation or the trajectory of how Ontarians are thinking about voting? Let's ask Erin Kelly. She's joining us every week during this Ontario election campaign to tell us what the artificial intelligence algorithm known as Polly is seeing gain traction with voters. And there's Erin joining us now from the nation's capital. And without further ado, Tell us, what's getting sticky out there? What's gaining traction? Well, Stephen Del Duca, just right there, he is absolutely on fire. We have seen, Polly has seen that his seat count has doubled in the last week, his projected seat count. It's gone from uh, projected 10 seats to 20 seats just since the writ was, was uh, announced. And, um, and that has been largely at the expense of the NDP. So we mentioned last week that Andrea Horvath, her messaging wasn't resonating. That is just picking up steam. She is losing seats. And if this continues, by this time next week, we'll probably see the Liberals in second place. Aaron, do we know what accounts for that? Yes, it really, so what we're seeing is that NDP supporters and the NDP itself seems to be putting out a lot of messages around healthcare. And quite frankly, people are COVID tired. I understand why six months ago, this was, this was a good issue to, to strategize around. But today, the issue really is affordability. And Stephen Del Duca has the best message on affordability. It's focused. It's easy to understand. And when it's easy to understand and focus, people share it in their network. They share it amongst their friends. So his messaging is just traveling a lot faster and much more efficiently than Andrew Horvath's. It's really translating into a big change in seat count. Let's touch on an issue that the three so-called progressive parties, the Liberals, New Democrats, and Greens, all take one position on in very big distinction to the current government of Ontario, uh, the progressive conservatives, and that's Highway 413 to be built across the top of the greater Toronto area. Uh, what's Polly saying about that? Well, we're not seeing a whole lot of discussion about that uh, right now. Um, it's... I don't think it's a it's a it's an issue that is changing uh, how people are going to vote. So, in other words, uh, everybody sort of expects the progressive parties to oppose it. They expect the government to favor it, and that's the end of it. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. How about Denicare? The NDP came out with a Denicare announcement that seemed to get a lot of attention when it happened. What's Polly saying? Again, we're seeing that uh, the NDP's policies are appealing to people who are hardcore NDP supporters, and there's just not enough of them to, to keep the momentum going. So it's not appealing to people outside of her demographic. And the, and the other issue, I will just say while we're on the topic of her demographic, she's also brought out policies about um, freezing taxes for lower and middle income people. But we see that those people aren't discussing taxes. It's really higher income people who are in favor of tax breaks. So again, she's, she's not hitting the mark that will enable her to get, to grow her, her base or to grow her seat count. Okay, lots of stories lately about healthcare staffing shortages, nurses, doctors, uh, not on the job, oftentimes because they're fighting COVID-19 themselves, stress, burnout, et cetera. Uh, what kind of traction are you picking up on what the parties have to offer on those issues? We're not seeing that, um, I mean, really, People are seeing that the progressive conservatives, they've said that they're going to invest in, in health care and that they've learned their lessons from COVID. Um, and, and people, the electorate, seem to trust that that, that party will do that. And they don't, they don't feel that it's a reason to switch their vote. Okay. Let me circle back on the uh, Liberals issue. Stephen Del Duca, you mentioned off the top, because he made a lot of promises related to education during week one. Hiring 10,000 new teachers, uh, spending hundreds of millions of dollars building new schools, 
and well, billions actually, billions on new schools and renovating existing schools, uh, bringing back an option for grade 13 and so on. Uh, again, uh, as Pauli looks at this, how much traction are those policies having? Those policies are, um, they get traction among NDP supporters. So they're, they, they are effective in getting some of that seat count from the NDP to the Liberals. Those issues are not taking from the PCs, which Del Duca does have to do. Uh, and, and he will best be able to do that by focusing on affordability. That really is the thing that is catapulting him right now is the feeling that he understands voters to the extent that any of the leaders are seen to understand voters. I mean, that's another issue. Engagement on this election is really low, and that's something we should discuss. Um, people actually don't feel that any of the leaders, if they're being completely honest, have the right solution. But to the extent that anyone does, we're seeing more and more people uh, leaning towards Stephen Del Duca. All right. In terms of engagement, then, let's continue on that. Um, is what you're finding leading us, sadly, to the possibility that voter turnout will be really quite low? Yes, I think that's a real risk in this election. Normally, when an election is called, there's some fanfare around it and we see engagement go up. We didn't see engagement go up at all when this election was called last week. It's the same people, people who are generally very interested in politics uh, talking about issues. And here's the really interesting part. Young people very underrepresented in the discussion, except young women. Um, and there's a reason for that, if you want to get into vote switching drama. Go for um, it. Because there is a potential vote switching. We saw the first potential vote switching topic that came up this morning. Um, you know, I mentioned last week that uh, Polly normally she looks at decided voters and then she looks at undecided voters. But this time we're going to look at vote switchers because we saw in the last election, last federal election, a lot of progressive, a lot of conservative voters switched their vote from the conservatives um, because of the vaccine policy. So those are people who are lifelong conservatives who for the first time voted for a different party because of the the stance that the conservatives took on vaccines. And so we decided to look at vote switchers again this for this election. And uh, we saw our, our first potential vote switching issue today. Okay, okay. Uh, what's the issue and from what to what? So um, this is an issue that we've been tracking in the last well, for seven years, and we've never seen it come up in any Canadian election, and it's come up for the first time this morning, and that's abortion. Um, Polly is seeing that this is a potential powder keg that's waiting to be lit, um, and that's why young women are much more engaged in the election, in, in election talk right now, than young men. Young men are saying, well, the PCs are going to win. This is in the bag. There's no point in me participating or me voting. Women are saying, there's a lot at stake here. I'm getting more engaged in this election, and I'm concerned that the Conservatives, because health care is a provincial issue, um, that, and this is a Conservative Party. Now, people aren't worried about Doug Ford, but there are people in his party um, that support, that are pro-life, and and people are paying attention to that. And we, see, we do see some PC uh, voters saying, if this issue comes up, and if I have any reason to think that um, that this party will lower women's right to choose, I will switch my allegiance. And they're overwhelmingly saying they will switch it to the NDP. Interesting. Well, um, I well remember that the day that the American Supreme Court decision, or at least draft of a decision, was leaked, Doug Ford was asked about it on the campaign hustings, and he said the U.S. Supreme Court has zero jurisdiction on the province of Ontario. He really tried to put this to bed quite quickly. Can you tell whether or not he has been successful in doing that? He has not been successful in doing that. Now, it's not Doug Ford personally. If I were in the NDP strategy room right now, I would be looking for candidates in the PC party that I could poke to provoke them to say something controversial during this campaign, because the indications are that could, that could unravel for the PCs pretty quickly. So right now, the PCs are pretty steady. They are in first place and they're in comfortable first place. But if there was one thing that could change that right now, Polly is identifying abortion as that potential issue. Fascinating. Last week, you told us that there wasn't a huge undecided vote out there and that it didn't look like they were sort of leaning one way or another yet. Any change in that? There's not a change in the undecided. The, the, you know, the, 
The worrisome thing here is that the undecideds are, as it stands right now, there's a good chance they won't vote at all. I mean, we really are seeing low engagement here. So, and, and if there's low engagement, that favors the conservatives. So if you're a liberal or NDP supporter, especially if you're a liberal supporter and you're your allegiances are somewhat new, right? Like people are just hopping on the bandwagon last week. Liberal and NDP supporters are less likely to vote. So the main thing right now, I think, is to get this engagement up to have issues that are exciting to people, that are easy to understand, and really to make people feel that you have a policy that can work. Right now, with the exception of Stephen Del Duca, people are feeling, okay, all the leaders are saying we're gonna bring bring about housing affordability, but there's a belief that that's not going to happen. Uh, there's, there's a lot of defeatism here among the electorate. So I think people have to get, the leaders have to get more specific. They have to really inspire confidence in a way they're not doing now, that they have a solution that is going to work and that the newspapers aren't gonna say the next day, that's never gonna work. Because that, that seems to be what's happening right now. All the analysts come out and say, that's not gonna work. And so they, they need to, consult with the experts and, and have people say, yes, this is a plan that will probably work. And the first leader who can do that, who can actually get some momentum going that they have a workable plan, will shoot up and, and hopefully get the engagement up on this election. Well, let's see what issues might do that. You told us abortion had a chance to do that. You said Buck a Ride had a lot of uh, um, uptake among the uh, people who are on social media and, and public opinion was reflecting that. Any other issues out there right now that you can see at this early juncture of the campaign that might get more engagement or at least get the leaders offering something that would get people more interested? Well, having a, a strategy around housing that people will believe and that seems credible and realizable in the next term, uh, that would be the, the big vote winner right there. Affordability, cost of living issues, and uh, and and keeping it very simple, it, having tax breaks and stuff like that. It doesn't. I mean, tax breaks resonates with wealthier groups, but they're not the ones complaining about affordability. So you need to have something that appeals to the people who are having trouble making ends meet right now in the province. Let me follow up on that because, of course, uh, well, I'll give one example here. Uh, just before the election was called, the progressive conservative government offered a billion dollar rebate to people who drive cars. Right? They said you don't have to buy these license plate renewal stickers anymore, and in fact, we're going to send you a check in the mail to rebate what you paid last year. A billion dollars out of the Treasury, and there's obviously um, arguments pro and con on the advisability of doing that. Uh, similarly, the Liberals have promised uh, with their buck a ride uh, to subsidize uh, urban transit use by to the tune of a billion dollars as well. Do you have anything in your research which suggests that people see those as genuinely making life more affordable or more akin to trying to bribe me with my own money? People liked the rebates on the license plates. We saw that that was, that was very good for Doug Ford. Um, he's also getting credit for the childcare deal. So people are really happy about that. So he, you know, he's definitely getting kudos for that. And Buck Ride is doing really well. So even though in that case, you know, the expert said, well, how realizable is Buck Ride or, you know, is this good for the treasury? It definitely worked with the electorate because it's very, easy to understand, you're giving me money. You're giving me money back. We're having, being able to take the bus and it only costing a dollar, I can really understand how that helps me. I'm not sure how the tax cut will help me. Does it help me right now? I mean, it doesn't sound like it's more money in my pocket and I need more money because food is very expensive and, and shelter is very expensive. So keeping the status quo isn't going to help me. But it sounds like they're not making the connection, the voters anyway, are not making the connection that a billion dollar rebate today means inflating the deficit today, which means raising taxes or cutting programs tomorrow. They're not making that connection? Absolutely not. If I need to pull out the spreadsheet to explain why this is or isn't a good policy, then I then you've lost me, right? It really, and that's what's killing it for Andrea Horvath. She's too complicated. Um, you want something where you can say to your friends, hey, did you hear that if we vote for Stephen Del Duca, public transit's a buck a ride? That's easy to communicate, pass it on, right? That that just goes like wildfire. If I have to say, yeah, but if we if we put money into the economy now, that's gonna make prices rise and inflation's gonna get worse, 
now now I need like a economics degree to know what you're talking about. So <laughs> it has to be, and and this is the job of the leader to have policies that are well grounded. So you've done all that work in the background and are easy to communicate so that people can tell their neighbors about it. Aaron, let me ask you one last thing. And that is, uh, there was a book written, I don't know, maybe two decades ago by Thomas Frank called What's the Matter with Kansas? And the gist of the book, for those who haven't read it, was that it seemed that lower income people were voting Republican in the United States, um, despite the fact that it could be argued that was against their own economic self-interest, but that they lined up with Republican, with the Republican Party more in terms of values. You know, pro-capital punishment, anti-abortion, that kind of thing. Now, we're usually a few years behind the U.S. on those kinds of culture wars. Can you tell whether that's happening in this province right now? It's happening to a... Yes, it is happening in that province now, uh, in this province now. Um, but it's still a small slice of the population. So Ontario is overwhelmingly, for example, pro-choice, and I haven't seen anybody talking about capital punishment. So we even looked up crime. We're specifically tracking crime, and nobody's really talking about crime as an issue in this particular election. So we have seen it in other elections. We definitely saw it in the federal election that um, that 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 conservative, those values are strong. And, and even among people, like you say, who are lower income and would benefit from some of the programs that liberals and NDP are proposing, but they vote according to values. We definitely have that cohort in Canada. That's not playing right now in this election. It, it is playing, like I mentioned, on abortion, but it's because it's a pro-choice group, uh, sorry, yeah, pro-choice kind of movement that's coming up in the electorate we're definitely not seeing conservative values being discussed a lot right now for this particular election. Understood. Aaron, thanks for today, and we will uh, talk to you again next week. Great, thank you. That's Aaron Kelly, CEO of Advanced Symbolics, Inc. Ontario's 2022 budget was dubbed by the government as a plan for better jobs and bigger paychecks. And given that it's effectively the PC's election platform, it's probably fair to say that it reflects a widespread sense that economic issues, from kitchen tables to gas pumps, for example, will motivate more than a few voters. With us now on what's on offer and whether the campaign trail is even a good place to talk about economic policy, let's introduce our guests, as is our custom, from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in Lethbridge, Alberta, with Ken Bosenkuhl, Senior Fellow at the Smart Prosperity Institute and a Research Fellow at the C.D. Howe Institute. In Montreal, Quebec, Alison Christians, Professor and Chair of Tax Law at McGill University and co-author of Tax Cooperation in an Unjust World. And in the nation's capital, there's Armin Yalnesian economist and Atkinson Fellow on the future of workers, and we're delighted to have you three back with us here on TVO tonight. Allison, do you still love tax law? I'm just checking. I'm just checking. <laughs> you you, you know I do. There you go. Okay. Yeah. We have the proof. You, we know you still love tax law. We are going to put a few of the party's promises under the sort of... Um, experts microscope, if I can call it that, tonight. And uh, we'll get each of you to weigh in on what you believe makes economic sense and perhaps what doesn't. And let's start with what I think has captured a great deal of attention during this election campaign, and that is the Liberal so-called Buck-A-Ride province-wide plan, where they would essentially subsidize to the tune of $700 million the first year and more than a billion dollars in the second year uh, the cost of riding the rails or the buses or the streetcars or whatever, wherever you live in this province. Let's go through this. Armin, what do you think? Oh, I think it's a genius plan because it's directly taking on Buck a Beer, which lasted all of a few weeks, and I think only one brand put it out. Um, so a Buck a Ride is actually transformational as a form of public infrastructure that will literally put money in the pockets of the people that need it most and deal with our problems with climate change and carbon emissions and increase the demand for better public transit. Uh, and it also rivals the highway plan of the uh, incumbent government. So it, in every way, it is a real alternative to what's on the menu with if, if we kept on with this government. Allison, buck a ride province-wide. What do you think? 
Yeah, unfortunately, I have to disagree. I think it's not a great idea. I totally get that the heart is in the right place or maybe near the right place, but you have to means test things like these because you're building an infrastructure that has to be paid for. And if you give a buck a ride, that's a buck a ride if you're a multimillionaire living in a mini mansion and if you're somebody living on minimum wage. That doesn't make fiscal sense to me. Ken, let me get you in, and then we're going to go over a second round on this because I want to hear what Armin has to say about, about Allison's opinion. Go ahead, Ken. Well, the interesting thing about voting in Canada is increasingly the richer you are, the more likely you are to vote Liberal. And the Liberals in their press release on this said that this was for people living in Oakville going to the Jays game. And so they're targeting rich people and subsidizing rich people taking transit. Now, you know, as, as Allison just said, if you really want to help poor people take transit then subsidize poor people's transit don't give a hundred buck a ride to anyone that's out there and so the liberals are just targeting their swing voters which are rich people in oakville and trying to win the election by doing that but i think it's bad public policy although ken i mean you're a guy who's been involved in many election platforms in the past you'll have to admit that buck a ride province-wide sounds better than buck a ride as long as your income isn't too high and you're eligible for it and low <laughs> enough income right that, you know, look, uh, elections are about sending signals about the kind of priorities that you have to the general population, and you have to do it in a way that is catchy, and you can't put uh, too, if you're explaining, you're losing. And so, sure, that it's a, it has a nice jingle to it, but that doesn't mean it, it, that doesn't make it good public policy. You, could, you can have a good jingle and have good public policy, but this is neither of those things, or uh, one of those things. Okay. Armin, you want to come back on any of this? Oh, you bet. <laughs> so, you know, we're talking about a government that is in power that wishes to spend $25 billion on highways. And that also advances the uh, economic interests of those with more money than less money. This actually spends more money on the poorest, the people that don't have cars, the people that need to rely on public transit, the people that are looking for work that are long-term unemployed, the disabled, people on social assistance, the unemployed, students, everybody gets to discover their city, discover Ontario and where you live uh, in your own community. What, where it fails is the group of people that don't live in urban centers with good uh, transit. That, that is its own, only failure. Because in my view, to encourage people to take public transit is a social good. And you want to encourage rich people to take it too and not just stick in their cars. Plus, if you don't have a car, it's good public policy. If you do have a car, it's good public policy because it's going to take people off the road. So win, win, win. All right. Having said that, Allison, is there any evidence that we know of that suggests that if you offer this kind of inducement to people, they actually will do what the hope is behind this thing, namely either leave the car at home or help more people take transit. Will it actually do that? Well, I think it might help people leave the car in the parking lot where they jump on the train. I'm not really sure exactly uh, who isn't taking transit because it's too costly now. So that's part of the picture. But look, I totally agree that this is a much better, it's much better to build infrastructure around public transit than what the Conservative Party has on offer, which is to build more roads. Both of those plans, th those plans seem to go in opposite directions. So what are we really trying to do here? We're trying to build ways to move people around that doesn't cause or contribute to climate disaster. So in that way, the policy wins, but it has to be paid for. And that is, I think, the thing that worries me when politicians talk about giving across the board uh, you know, breaks to people, regardless of their ability to pay. It really interferes with that idea that the tax system, first and foremost, it should be fair. And this isn't. Well, let me do one follow-up on this, one last follow-up with Ken, and that is, you know, this is a two-year plan at the moment. As I say, $700 million the first year, more than a billion the second year. What happens the third year? I mean, can you imagine if you've been riding, let's say, the Toronto Transit Commission subway for two years at a buck a ride, there's no indication at the moment whether the fares go back to what they used to be in year three. Is that a problem in terms of how you craft this thing? 
Yeah, perhaps. I, I think the problem with transit is that there's not enough of it going to places where people want to use it. And so instead of spending money for two years and having a question mark at the end, what they should have done is more long term planning to build transit. Instead of subsidizing riders, they should have subsidized the building of transit and then give low income people maybe a bit more cash bill to afford it. So I think it's just all wrong for all kinds of reasons. It doesn't help in the planning of, of infrastructure, it doesn't uh, of transit. And so I, I again, uh, transit, the problem with transit is there's not enough of it going where we need it and building more of it and not subsidizing ridership is the better way to go okay item two the ndp came out with uh, a denticare plan and uh the leader andrea horvath said we have ohip we have medicare basically for problems that take place anywhere else in our body why would a problem you have inside your mouth somehow be exempt and when you put it that way that's a pretty fair argument allison what's your view on a publicly funded denticare plan yeah, okay, so you just have to think about what it is that you think should be in the public sector versus in the private sector. So when you say a dental care plan, are you talking about preventative care, cavities, and solving problems before they arise? That sounds like health care to me. But are you talking about teeth straightening um, and whitening or, you know, f you know, surgery to change the shape of your jaw or something? You know, maybe it's not quite as easy to just say, you know, the dental care should be... Uh, public in the same in, in the same way you have to think about well you know what uh, social goal are you trying to achieve and if the social goal is make, get everybody up to a certain level of dental health I think that's something that uh, I'm, I'm not sure why we wouldn't get behind that seems like a good idea to me well let's go back to the income testing issue and I mean you know right now the way the NDP have structured it you could make ninety thousand dollars a year and be eligible for this dental care program rising at a certain point to two hundred thousand dollars of annual income and still be eligible for this. So let's get back to the income tested thing. Is that too high a threshold to be eligible in your view? It's interesting because we already have dental care for low income Canadian uh, uh, Ontarians. Uh, it was introduced, uh, the Healthy Smiles program was introduced in 2016 to do exactly what it is that Allison was talking about, provide preventive care and basic primary care. It isn't tooth whitening, it isn't tooth straightening. It is just making sure that we prevent the preventable, which is cavities. In not, over 90% of cases, cavities are preventable, and yet people don't have access to primary care. So the question you are raising is, should everybody get this? And there is an argument to be said that everybody should get good preventive health care to minimize the costs of the system. But there, we also know that higher income people already pay out of pocket for these things. So I think this is a really interesting democratic debate. Without question, we need this preventive care for people that would otherwise not take it. And across Canada, that's uh, over 6 million people that can't afford a dentist. Um, and so this idea that the and Ontario NDP have I don't know how different it would be from what we already have that was introduced under uh, Kathleen Wynne's liberals. And I don't know how different it would be than what the federal NDP are offering, other than we would raise the ceiling for more people. I have to say, for me, the jury's out as to whether we want universal access to preventive, basic dental care, or whether we want richer people to pay for it more. My argument would be kind of along the line of what Ken said earlier about public transit. We should have more progressive taxation. Rich people should pay for it in the in, in through their taxes, but not at point of use. It should be a public good. Ken, your view on this Denticare plan by the NDP? Yeah. Uh, I'm not known in this wide world of sports as a New Democrat voter, but I really like this, and I like it for the following reason. Uh, as, as I understand it, they're looking at the gaps that exist, people that don't have private insurance. So the government's actually not trying to, or the NDP are not proposing, as I understand it, to crowd out private insurance, but to fill gaps in the healthcare system of people that don't have private insurance. And I think that's a really good way to think about how to, uh, if we're going to improve healthcare, we should look at gap filling as opposed to universal treatment or just giving it to everybody. 
Party. And I think there's other areas of healthcare where this might be a smart idea to go. So I'm, I'm very intrigued by this. Uh, I also think it should be done at the provincial level. So Armin, uh, just tell the federal NDP to get out of it and let the provinces do it. This is healthcare's provincial jurisdiction. We should be delivering healthcare at the provincial level and the Liberals and the NDP should break their silly little deal and not worry about health, about dental care. But I, I like the idea of a gap filling dental care program that fills a gap for people that aren't otherwise able to get uh, get insurance. It wouldn't be a good Canadian discussion if we didn't have a fight about which jurisdiction and level of government is responsible for... Anyway, exactly. leaving that aside. Okay, policy issue number three. The Greens, they want to provide significant incentives for businesses investing in, for example, energy efficient and low carbon equipment, buildings, vehicle fleets, and so on. Uh, they'd put big subsidies behind making that happen. Uh, who's going to go first? Ken, you are. What do you think of this idea? You know, uh, I'm I'm part of a group called Conservatives for Clean Growth, and um, we've put forward a number of, or been helping campaigns put forward green plans. Uh, my own preference is to have a carbon tax, to ramp up the carbon tax and to rely on that and not double it up by doing all these other things. Um, but I acknowledge that there are people, some people would prefer to use a carbon tax, some people would prefer to use these subsidies and other things. I worry a little bit that these sort of interventionist, regulatory and spending programs are less efficient than having a carbon tax and letting people People make their own decisions. I'd be much more open to a carbon tax that rises more quickly than having government regulate and spend more money on these on these types of programs. But clearly, we have a we have a climate issue we need to deal with. Clearly, we need to put better policy in place, and anything that moves in that direction is the right way. I just have a small preference for a market based solution like a carbon tax, even if that means raising it a little faster. You're never going to be leader of the Conservative Party with ideas like that. You know that, Ken. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Allison, go ahead. You go second. What do you think of this idea by the Greens to subsidize um, more environmentally sensible behavior? Yeah, I, again, I don't like this idea either, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. But <laughs> I think what we should be doing is making um, the cost of things that pollute the environment and cause environmental externalities to cost more. And that will act as a subsidy for things that are sustainable. So instead of larding the tax act with yet another incentive or yet another credit, the fix here is to make the polluter pay. Okay, and now we talk about carbon taxes, but the carbon taxes are way too low and they're just insufficient and they attack the consumer. We need to get at those profits. Profits that are being made from unsustainable production uh, need to be taxed away. And that's not popular either. Uh, no party wants that, I understand that, but that's the right idea. And bad tax policy is whenever you see a problem, you try to fix it by paying somebody to do the opposite. No, you should tax the problem itself. In fairness, I guess I should say the NDP and the Liberals also have their own versions of a very similar plan, which is essentially to give subsidies and or tax breaks to those who want to retrofit their houses, renovate, etc., make them more energy efficient and so on. Armin, what do you think of the idea? I guess I'm going to uh, piggyback on what Ken said and say that I'm all for something that both punishes the bad behavior and rewards those who wish to act because not everybody has the, the pocket change to do the changes that we know need to happen. And my God, we are in a climate emergency. If we, have, if we haven't figured it out yet, it's gonna be coming at us pretty darn soon. So I think the idea of uh, both taking with one hand and giving with the other makes a lot of sense at a time when we have no time to waste. Having the market fix things is fine if everybody had the money to fix things. The one thing I would say about the uh, green plan is I was surprised it was just business in incentives. Because to your point, Steve, uh, there are more households than there are businesses. And there's more that every individual household can do to change its energy consumption. However, it is businesses and particularly big polluters, climate emission producers uh, that are driving the trajectory. So if you only had a certain amount of money, focusing it on businesses is a good idea. But I, I guess the question is, why, why don't we have all hands on deck right now? Let's do another round as it relates to electric vehicles, because we know the three so-called progressive parties are offering as much as $10,000 uh, to incentivize people to buy electric vehicles, uh, even electric bicycles. There's incentives for those as well. Uh, the progressive conservatives have, I guess, belatedly come on board with some of that. Uh, they certainly canceled all those programs when they first came in, but they uh, appear to be getting religion on it now. 
Um, okay, Allison, start us off on this. What do you think of these incentives? Okay, so I'll just repeat it again. Like, if a car cost what it actually costs to produce the car in terms of ex externalities for the future, then you wouldn't need to incentivize the more sustainable one because the more sustainable one would be cheaper. So the answer here is to tax away the unsustainable profits. That's harder, and people don't like to talk about that. But it's in the production of unsustainable processes and unsus using unsustainable, non-renewable resources those should be much, much higher. And if you're worried about getting people to be able to afford the one that's more sustainable, that's just a different question. This question of affordability and making uh, having people have enough to live on is just a separate question. It shouldn't be always attached to these incentivizing uh, behaviors that we want and getting rid of the behaviors we don't want. Ken, your view on the EVs? Uh, just quickly, you know, I live in Alberta and 70% of emissions in Alberta are industrial and 30% are retail. In Ontario, 60% are retail and 40% are industrial. So if Ontario is going to deal with climate change, they really need to get at the consumer at the retail side. So I, I just to back up what Maramine said, I think that's very important to understand. Ontario needs to deal with the retail side. And that's what they're trying to do here. But again, my bias would be to raise to raise the carbon price and give people income as opposed to uh, patting them on the back and slapping them across the front or whatever, like using both hands. I prefer to use the incentive approach. Uh, I'm with Allison on this. And I, you know, the Ecofiscal Commission that I was involved with a number of years ago calculated that the implicit carbon price of, a, of a, most of these vehicle subsidies are like three or $400. That's like, we, it's just inefficient for the government to be subsidizing these things as opposed to having a rising carbon price. Armin, your view. Uh, it's complicated because I don't think it is just about how we're rewarding or penalizing people if we are going to make this switch. And the war in Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine, and Germany's reliance on Russian oil made it really clear to me that how we get the electricity for the electric vehicles are just as important. What is the infrastructure for fueling up these new vehicles is just as important as making people buy different things or penalizing them for what they're buying. And I don't think we're there yet. I mean, I think we keep kind of lurching towards solutions on what kind of a vehicle are you going to drive, which brings us back right to the top of this conversation, which is a buck -a ride province-wide, is perhaps the most um, retail level, as uh, Ken said, the most granular way of getting us to change our behaviors at a scale that could make a difference, that could actually move the needle. We're going to have to get more people to drive less, period, whether it's an electric vehicle or a gas. I mean, obviously, the world is moving towards more EVs, uh, and we are going to be producing them, and that's all cool, uh, but it's not the move that we think it is in terms of reducing carbon emissions. And if the goal is about reducing carbon emissions, now, how are you behaving, madam or Mrs. Car Driver? Uh, mm -hmm. If the goal is to reduce carbon emissions, we have to be ruthlessly focused on what we are doing to both use energy and reduce our use of energy. It's interesting you put it that way, because I was talking to Diane Sachs on the weekend, the deputy leader of the Ontario Greens, and she said, this sounds great. And of course, her party is putting something out on that. But she says the reality is if you're just re replacing all of the internal combustion cars on the highways today with electric vehicle cars, you've still got problems with sprawl, you've still got problems with traffic congestion, you've still got demands to build more highways, and therefore you're not really getting any further ahead in right that on. respect. So she agrees with you. And while I've brought up highways, let's do that next. Issue four here, the progressive conservatives who don't really have an election platform other than the budget they introduced at the uh, end of April, which of course was uh, tabled but not passed, they have allocated $25 billion dollars for new highway construction, they say it's important to move people, goods, and as a spur to the economy. Okay, Armin, you up first this time. What do you think? Okay, so this goes to what Allison and Ken have been saying is how are you going to pay for it? There it is. That's the budget. $25 billion. It's already baked in. We've already got the revenues to cover it. Um, and that is the craziest p way to spend $25 billion I can think of. There is one highway that they mention in the budget that truly does need building, and that's the highway to the north. And we've been talking about that for almost as long as I've been alive, this whole ring of fire thing. 
if we only got one highway done, God bless us if it's that one, because it would open up economic development from the north. However, the idea that that money is there to do pretty much anything we want is underscored by a secondary fact that is not well understood in this budget. I was comparing this budget to last year's budget, two pandemic year budgets. And for the year that just passed, 2021-2022, the Ontario government managed to get their projection for that year, a year ago, wrong by... Um, $9 billion worth of spending. They spent less, $9 billion less than they said they were going to spend on healthcare and education and other basic programs. And they received $19 billion more than they said they were going to get a year ago. That is not a rounding error, ladies and gentlemen. That is deliberate undercounting of the money they are getting and the money they are spending. And it reminds me a great deal of what happened in the run up to the, two, the year 2000 election, where Paul Martin had cut uh, spending so dramatically that they generated surpluses three years ahead of time. And they used those surpluses in the run up to the 2000 election to out tax cut Preston Manning and the Reform Party. I don't know whether we are building in some kind of weirdo surprise surplus business in this budget, but it's not just the $25 billion that I think is badly allocated of the money we've got. It's the money they didn't spend on healthcare, the money they didn't spend on education, and the revenues that they, the, the windfall of revenues that they didn't count on and how they're using them. I, I think it's a hugely problematic budget, and if that's the roadmap for the future, we're in trouble. Allison, $25 billion for highways. What say you? Yeah, okay. So if I have, on the one hand, $25 billion for highways, or on the other hand, all of the above, uh, the buck a ride, the um, tax incentives for electric vehicles, uh, and for, uh, you know government-subsidized dental care, I'll take all of the above. This is a terrible idea. If what you're trying to do is forestall our ability to uh, address climate change, if you're trying to encourage ur urban sprawl, if you're trying to reward people who live very, very far away from where they work and discourage having a community, if you want to discourage using uh, technology to build hybrid workplaces, this is the budget to do it. Uh, <laughs> I can't find anything that I like in this idea at all. I, I I understand this idea about the road to the north, and I hear what you said about that. I appreciate that idea. Uh, maybe instead of a road, it's a rail. Uh, maybe we need to go back to that buck a ride uh, question again and think about that some more. I'm not sure. But yeah, I, I don't like anything about this idea, uh, this budget at all. Ken, do you like anything about $25 billion for roads? Well... Conservative voters are people who drive to survive, and they are rural people who are in their vehicles a lot because they live in remote communities, or they're suburban people. Even if they take the train to work, they drive their kids to uh, to hockey and to ballet and to music lessons and all those kind of things. So this is this is a this is a, a reach out to their voters, a signal that they understand their voters, and that's a that's a political reality that they're dealing with. I, I would I would tend to echo the the other sentiments of the other guests uh, by saying if there's an economic argument for these highways then that makes more sense to me than a, than a commuter argument for these highways and if we you know if we need more goods coming into toronto and we need highways to make sure the trucks get there on time if we can get the ring of fire and all the all the all the mining activity we can get to get batteries for the future of electric cars i mean i think our mean makes a really strong argument for that we've been talking about it for a long time so i would prefer to hear economic arguments for these highways than pure commuter arguments for these highways um but i think what's happening here is a is a political signal to the people that vote conservative yeah the the the, uh, the studies that have been done objectively by organizations that don't have any skin in the game say that the commuter arguments are basically baseless that there are no reasons to do it but as you say there are other arguments to marshal here as well ken all right let's let's go on to the deficits because all of the spending that we've talked about here and of course these are only a, a tiny fraction of the promises that the uh, different parties have made uh, will result in uh, considerable expenditures of billions of dollars. So, Sheldon, can we have the next graph up, please? Because we're going to look at the deficit projections in the billions of dollars going the next few years out. And we'll compare the Liberals and the Progressive Conservatives because the NDP hasn't brought out their fully costed plan yet, and neither have the Greens. The Liberals brought theirs out this morning. And for the fiscal year in which we are currently operating, 22-23, 
the Liberals are matching the conservative budget number of nearly $20 billion of deficit spending. If you go to next fiscal year, the Liberals are spending a little bit more, $3 billion and change, than the Conservatives would. And if you go to the following fiscal year, the Liberals are still spending about a billion too more than the Progressive Conservatives. And we don't have it on this chart, but if you go one year beyond that, they even up again. And they are the same numbers. So, we have, in the province of Ontario at the moment, and I'll go to the tax expert on this one first. That's you, Allison. We have a situation where we are bringing in uh, red-hot revenue, right? Like, the revenues are going through the roof right now. But so is the spending. And the deficits are actually getting higher this year compared to last year, despite record revenues coming in. My question is, is this a good idea? Your view. Yeah, so, okay. Is it terrible to have a deficit? No, if you're investing in the future. So a deficit means that you're going to pay for that tomorrow or the next day. Uh, so what are you paying for? And is this actually going to build the returns in the future? So I'm not, you know, 100% strictly anti-deficit, but you have to think about this. But here's the problem. And I think this is the problem that you see in all politi uh, political platforms. They really want to give people what they want to hear in order to, to elect them, but they don't want to tell people that this costs money. So I've seen the dental plan called free. It's not free. Obviously, these things cost money. It's not free to have anything that the government pays for. And guess what? It's not the government paying for it. It's you and me and our children and their children. So, you know, it's it's this idea that politicians have a hard time explaining. We, If you want these things that we seem to want, then we have to spend money. And if we want to spend money, then we have to collect it from us. It's us together as a society that have to pay for these things. So if we decide we want them, we have to figure out a fair way to allocate the cost. And you don't see any talk about that at all. Well, I was going to say, there, there well, because there is no talk of that right now, Ken. I mean, this is all deficit spending, which means that future citizens are going to be paying for it. Uh, I, I'd like your view on the implications uh, for now and down the road of record revenue coming in and yet deficits continuing to get larger in the face of increased government spending. What's your take? Well, Doug Ford has the word conservative in his party name, but I'm convinced that his ideology is customer service as opposed to anything resembling conservatism. So I, I don't think he's motivated by these kinds of issues, number one. Number two, and at the risk of sounding more like Armin in her writing, you know, we've spent the last 20 years being pretty fiscally responsible. We spent, we spent, uh, you know, the governments in Ontario have been very tight for many years. Uh, the federal government has been very tight for a number of years uh, and until the last number of years. But what that did is it set us up with the ability to deal with this pandemic. We ran a lot of big deficits. We were able to do that because we were fiscally responsible. So I, on these things, I tend to take the long view. I don't think we're out of the woods yet. Uh, on the on the post pandemic recovery, what does that look like? What are our priorities? So, I'm I'm not I'm not one to say we should balance the budget immediately. I think there are some big challenges coming up. My concern is less about how big of the deficit is. Why are we running deficits? What are we mm -hmm. spending the money on? And are we are we making sure that down the road we're prepared for other emergencies? What is the, what is the next? Uh, emergency. It's like every six months, some crazy thing is happening. Our energy prices go through the roof because of war in Ukraine. The pandemic happens. And I think structurally, Canada has been in a better place because of our policies of the last 20 years and got our fiscal house in order and allowed us to get through this pandemic, run huge deficits and still be what I would call affordable. And so now we've got to say, let's, 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 think long term and make sure we're prepared for the next whatever the crisis is. But I'm not sure we're completely out of the current one. So, um, yeah, balancing budgets are important. I'm a conservative. I prefer to do that. But I'm not I'm not so excited about that quite yet until I know that we've that we're getting through this crazy couple of two years in the pandemic and what what kind of weird things are going to happen to our workforce and many other things as a result of this pandemic. We should have money ready for that. Armin, your view. I agree with both of your guests, uh, and it's a <laughs> pleasure to do so. Number one, nobody can balance the books quickly right now. And so the question, the, the chart that you put up just a few minutes ago showed 
a relatively speaking small difference between the liberals and the conservatives. And you know that the NDP and the Greens are not likely to balance books more rapidly. So we're seeing probably the most conservative of the parties showing that they can't balance the books immediately. The very small difference between the liberals and the conservatives largely focus on um, increased expenditures on not only a buck a ride, which is a big ticket item, but also building one and a half million homes and reducing cap sizes of uh, kids in classes to 20 students and hiring 10,000 new teachers. Can I just say, if you're looking forward and saying, how do you deal with the fact these are not the unknowns that Ken was pointing out more, uh, perhaps another wave of pandemic. We don't know what the unknowns are around the corner to channel Donald Rumsfeld, where the unknown unknowns <laughs> wait to be known down the road. However, we do know that population aging is coming to a neighborhood near you. And our kids were devastated. Ontario had the longest number of days of school closure of any jurisdiction in Canada, and Canada beat the band around the world on how many kids didn't get into uh, school. So we have got a lot of catch up to do for those kids, and they are going to be our future as the boomers retire. And we are going to need more newcomers. And if and since Ontario is the welcoming magnet for newcomers around the world, we need more housing. So these two things, more housing and better education for elementary and high school kids, as well as better um, uh, early learning and child care, this is looking around the corner and seeing what you know is coming at you and preparing for it. To me, that's worth a slightly higher deficit in the out years. Gotcha. Okay, we are down to our last few minutes here, and I want to get each of you on what seems to be the political reality, regardless of jurisdiction, in the country today. And that is, you can kind of promise whatever you like and spend a lot more if you want to, as long as you don't raise the taxes on anybody making less than $200,000 a year, and probably you can tax some corporations a little more as well. And I'd like to get your view, Allison, you start us off on this, I'd like to get your view on the advisability of what appears to be a new and unbreakable rule in political life in this country. Yeah, I think it's hard to talk about tax because for each individual, it makes a lot of sense when the government says, I'm going to put more money in your pocket. That makes a lot of sense. I'd like to have more money in my pocket. But when you put all those pockets together, that's us as a society, and there's not enough money to go around to uh, address health care, to address education, and to bring us into a world in which we have climate disaster happening around us. Uh, that people, people have a hard time getting from their own pocket to understanding society as a whole. And politicians, I don't know if they've taught people to be selfish or they've learned that selfish messages are effective. I don't know which one it is, but that's unfortunate. We need to think about not just is it bad for me to pay more tax. You know, of course I want to pay less tax. Just because I love tax law doesn't mean I love to pay more tax. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, right? I mean, I think we would all say that. But we also say that we have a vision for the society we want to live in. And for me, myself, personally, that vision does not include people being left behind, uh, being cast aside, and not having the basic health care and human rights that they need. Um, and so that's always, you know, that's a hard message from politicians. I get it. It's way easier to work that angle where nobody likes to pay more tax, even if they love tax law. <laughs> Ken, your view. <laughs> I'm going to disagree. I was I did politics in BC for a while, and I was uh, surprised as a conservative when I got there at how popular the carbon tax was. And in part, it was popular because they raised the carbon tax and lowered other taxes, and people made the connection between the two, and they knew they needed to have higher carbon prices to deal with the climate issues, and they were happy to see their other taxes go down. So I think governments should be much more creative than we've seen them be. I think there's going to be a lot of revenue coming in on from carbon pricing, industrial carbon pricing, and retail carbon pricing. 
And using those revenues creatively to lower other taxes can make them much more popular. And so I think governments, there is going to be some taxes that are going up and we pretend, I mean, conservatives, some of them running now, pretend that, that everyone hates carbon taxes, but there's no evidence for that. Carbon taxes have been going up in Canada and people say they're angry, but it's like a few cents at the pump and we need to do this. Everyone knows we need to do this. And that revenue can be used to lower other taxes, make that more popular and maybe spend a few dollars, but I'd prefer to lower cut or cut more taxes. I know our means <laughs> going to say she'd prefer to spend some of it, but, but I, look, I, I think we are in an era where taxes are going to go up and they're called carbon taxes and it's going to generate a ton of new revenue. And we're going to have to figure out how to, how to, how to spend that, how to spend that revenue, whether that's in cutting other taxes, which is my preference, or maybe our mean wants to spend it. But I think there's lots of new revenues coming in. Let's give the last word to Armin and she can tell us what she wants to do with it. <laughs> I couldn't agree more with Ken. Actually, taxes are going up and they are carbon taxes and we have all bought into the need for that. And that includes low income people. The second point I want to make is that not only in the wake or during and in the wake of this pandemic, hopefully we're in the wake of it, but since the global financial crisis, corporate concentration has galloped by leaps and bounds as has the concentration of wealth. And we have not taxed that. We have not taxed the people that have made out like bandits during this pandemic. Do you know, when I was looking at the last federal budget, I compared the affordability challenge to what happened in the wake of the first oil price shock in 1974 and what happened in the wake of the uh, Second World War when governments were dealing with labor shortages, supply shortages, everything shortages uh, back then, and that was causing inflation to spike. We go through certain periods in our lives. This is not unprecedented, but this is the only period I can see historically where we did not tax those that made out like bandits. So there is room to tax more at the top and there's nothing wrong with doing that. That's what the IMF and the World Bank have been talking about since 2010. More inclusive growth means taking from those at the top, spending on those at the bottom because those at the bottom actually boost the economy from the bottom up. So if you give them better jobs, you give them reasons to be paid better and give them better jobs through public services that literally put money in your pocket, they will pay more in revenues. So it's not the tax rate so much as how much money are you making and how much are you sharing in your uh, through, through your revenues. And that's where I think it's absolutely correct not to tax people at the bottom more other than through carbon taxes and to tax people at the top more so that we can actually build better public infrastructure for everybody and that will lift the whole system up. It is always a joy to have three such smart guests on our program as you three. <laughs> Ken Bosenkul, Armin Yalnesian, Alison Christians, thanks so much and be well out there, you three. Thank you so much. It was a delight. Thank you. <laughs> a lot of fun. That is the agenda for Monday, May the 9th, 2022. All the parties have been courting the labor vote. Tomorrow, we'll assess the relative merits of their pitches to working people. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.